Hey guys, Stan here. Before we get started with Scott's demo, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to Wacom for sponsoring this demo. You can get 10% off a Wacom Mobile Studio Pro using code LIGHTBOX2020 at the Wacom online store. The URL is in the description below. By the way, the code is for an additional 10% off, so if you have any other discounts, like a student discount, it'll be an additional 10% off of that. The sale runs from September 11th to the 25th, and is only available in the US. All right, take it away, Scott. Hi guys, my name is Scott Flanders, and today I'm gonna to be performing a brief demo, especially for Lightbox. I'm gonna share some of my thoughts about creature design, shape language, and my approach to rapid iteration. So without further ado, we're gonna get right to it. All right, let's go. 4,000 by 4,000 pixels at 600 DPI is like my standard document size I've been using for a number of years. Just a big square. Earlier, I was just warming up and started some simple creature designs right there, but we're going to start from scratch. And surprise, surprise, we're going to start with some silhouettes. Any of you guys who have uh, spent time in my classes or who know me well, you know I'm kind of a fan of silhouette as a starting point when it comes to designs. I'm really focusing on shapes. Now, I'm not, I'm not really. You know, to be honest, like this time, I'm less, I'm focused less on designing and a little bit more on uh, demoing in this particular case because we, we have a kind of a, we just have a time constraint. So I'm jumping, I'm just jumping right into things. Try to make this as interesting and engaging as possible as quickly as possible. But typically I would spend, I will usually spend like four to five hours just drawing in pencil before I would go uh, onto the computer like this. I don't necessarily have to do that, but I prefer to do that. I feel like it um, increases the probability of success when I'm working. It's like my due diligence in terms of design. I'm just going to generate a series of what I see as interesting, fun, uh, head shapes that are kind of within my comfort zone areas of interest. This is a kind of like fantasy Corythosaurus or Lambi Lambiosaurus, I think is the way to pronounce it. Gurney would probably know. Yeah, but just doing a fantastical version of a dinosaur like that. And I'll leave that small over here and I'm going to move on. I'm just going to generate a bunch of shapes first, somewhat a little more unconsciously. And we'll choose the ones that we find most interesting to proceed with into the next steps. Now, I've mentioned this to some of you before who've taken my classes. What th this is what I would refer to as designing from abstraction. So I'm spending a little less time up front. You know, I don't necessarily have like a, a super clear design prompt to work with from a designer. We could generate one, but. I kind of just want to do something a little different this time, approach things a little differently. This one's kind of cool. I'm going to leave that kind of a crazy iguanodon sort of head. Let's do another one. Now you notice I switched over to a rectangular, a rectangular brush for a moment, and that was just to sort of spice things up in terms of my mark making or my outer edges on my shapes. I've been using a lot of just, just lasso tool. And so everything is drawn, you know, it's very organic and freehand. And every once in a while, I like to break that up with some hard edge transitions. It's like, you know, you know, there's like the idea of like contrast. I, I mentioned this before, but you know, there's the idea of contrast in terms of, uh, you know, like value, saturation, just contrast in general as a way to make things more interesting visually when you're creating art. Well, the same thing can be done with edges with silhouette. So, you know, I can create more organic curving fluid lines. You know, this, this kind of stuff, you know, very like Heinrich Kley. So, you know, there's like those very fluid lines or if you ever looked at um, someone like Phil Hale's drawings, very, very fluid, very organic line work. But then every once in a while, just to spice things up, I like to come in here and just generate some like hard angles. 
You could do this with pencil too. It's just about control and pressure. You know, you can do it by hand or you could do it on the computer. Sometimes I'll hold down the shift key, getting kind of like a weird Skeksis character going on here. But I'll hold down, Oh shucks, I lost that selection. But you can hold down the shift key, kit key, to get that kind of thing, watch. Actually, wait, I'll do it here. So I'll switch to my chisel eraser tool. Just holding down shift key and doing a kind of like connect the dots approach, just pressing down. Flipping canvas to stay fresh, be able to assess my proportions as I'm going very quickly. So that's something that's a kind of a um, so sort of a habit for me at this point, but like a, a good habit. It's something I do somewhat unconsciously so I can go and check my proportions. I'm doing this throughout my process anytime I'm working. This guy, I'm getting kind of like a weird Skeksis, maybe like a Parasaurolophus. I'm basically making funny dinosaur heads at this point, like fantasy dinosaurs. I don't even know if that's what I want to go with, but let's see. Could be fun. Let's see what these turn out. They may, these may turn out to be some creepier creatures than I initially had in mind. I don't always like to use reference. Um, <laughs> you know, there's like a potential consequence to that and that you cut, you know, you, you're going to come up against the limits of your imagination or uh, of your memory, what you know, or what you've ingested already. And, uh, and that's, that's, that's when I know what, when I'm trying to push something to like a greater degree of realism, make it a little more convincing. That's when I know I need to bring in my reference just to push beyond what I'm currently you know, the sort of like details that I'm currently aware of or knowledgeable of. Okay, those are kind of cool. Let's, I'm going to expand this a little more. Just press C is the shortcut to crop. Takes my crop tool. Those of you guys who are new to Photoshop. Press C, extend that. Pro tip right now, save your work. Some of you guys may have experienced that kind of thing before. Spend a lot of time on something only to find yourself. In a real bad situation because you forgot to save it. This is looking more like a some kind of Komodo dragon creature. This one, shrink it down a bit to make it fit in the rest of the group. Again, I'm not thinking too hard. I'm just really I'm. I said at the beginning of this in the intro that I'm going to be performing a demo, and realistically, that's what I'm doing here. I'm performing. It's there's less time given to these designs because we just don't actually have the time for me to sit and obsessively think about my ideas and reflect and uh, iterate on my ideas here. Anyways, yeah, so this is just, I'm more like working from my comfort zone, just from imagination, having fun. I use the term uh, designing from abstraction because I'm just like finding interesting shapes as I put them down, evaluating them in real time and responding to them. And from my perspective, that's a very different thing than consciously designing. You know, maybe I'm kind of like splitting hairs, kind of splitting hairs. But from my perspective, you know, real design work, or at least most of my experience, like when I really considered, when I really consider myself to be like designing, is when I slow down and think about what I'm doing. And that's not really what I'm doing right now. I'm just making marks. It's not that you can't do that. It's not that that's not, it's not that that's never useful. It can be very useful when say you're designing some mutant monster zombie creatures or some giant, I'll show you actually, so I'll show you some examples so I can bring up on my screen. Here I was tasked with designing some, or the idea was to design some like tree creatures and sort of like, like ants, or the bit of swamp thing, a dash of swamp thing or man thing thrown in there. And that's the perfect place to design from abstraction. So like just abstract art. I'm laying down marks and responding to them, building on them, looking for forms in the marks that I'm putting down on the paper. And that's exciting and fun. I really like that process. But, and I, but, but I think a lot of uh, concept art, or at least a lot of the way concept art is presented online, is done in that way. And I don't necessarily think that that is a, like a complete presentation of the, uh, of the process or a complete or honest look at the process. Again, it works sometimes. There are some cases, like when I'm designing giant tree monsters, or I'm designing, let's see here, like uh, 
you know, these are some of the crazy fear eater creatures from uh, Wolves in the Green, this project with a buddy of mine, Mike Brainerd. Or say a character like Swamp Thing, like this demo from the past. There's a little more abstraction involved in the silhouette of the character. Or creatures for um, Tarpit Wars, this like personal project of mine, this kind of thing. Or, you know, mutant monster demons like, like Doom, Diablo. There, there are some themes or topics or that process of designing from abstraction really um, becomes very useful. It lends itself to it really nicely. So you're designing the heads of aliens or uh, alien spaceships or um, the, wep the weapons of an unknown, like ancient elvish civilization. Anytime you're dealing with organic shapes, a little more abstraction, that kind of thing, that kind of approach becomes very useful. But it becomes almost entirely not useful when you start designing like a teenage wizard girl or a tiny puppet master. I just want to make sure to address that distinction as often as I can for young students because I have, I've personally known quite a few young people, like friends of mine, that the, a lot of the way that, like, that art is presented on the internet, especially entertainment art, it's almost had like a bad effect on them, like, like on their ideas about art, like a negative impact on them and like what they think that they are supposed to be able to do and, uh, and what it means to design and what it means to be a concept artist. Like they think they're supposed to just be able to sit down and poop out amazing designs. And I just sit and I'm either good or I'm not. But I'm convinced that there are processes and approaches that you can use to help you generate ideas consistently. That's not to say that you will be, you know, as great at generating fresh ideas as, you know, Ian McKay or Carlos Huante or whatever, but it's going to give you something you can rely on so you can show up to the game and participate and be useful. So anyways, um, that's just something I want to address because I feel like a lot of times like the way art is presented on the internet is not exactly honest. And, um, you know, and I'm, I'm one to talk because my videos are edited. And uh, like most of the videos I do is hand or edited. To make them more interesting, just go faster so you guys don't have to see me um, being weird or hear me farting on accident or humming to myself. Or It just makes it better um, entertainment. But that kind of comes with a, a, a kind of a, like a consequence that people can get the wrong idea about all this stuff. When I've created some of the designs I'm like most proud of, They've been periods where I was really focusing in a very obsessive way over a long period of time and, and really hammering at an idea and exhausting it. I, I let the idea, I let the idea have like time to grow and develop, time to explore it. I, I can't, I don't know if I could really say honestly, if I can remember any idea that just, any fresh idea that I hadn't, that hadn't already occurred to me, like one that was sort of like inherited from my past. I can't, I can't say that there's been a single time where I just like popped out a new idea, like right here on the spot on camera or something like it's, it's not really how it works. That's what I'm trying to get across to you. So that's sort of like pressure to be that kind of concept artist. Like uh, it's not, it's not real. And you're doing yourself a disservice um, when you, uh, hold on to that kind of illusion or let that sort of illusion like take root. Real concept art and problem solving, not easy. Maybe for some people it's easy because they're super awesome, but uh, it's not, it's not easy for me. It's not easy for me. It's like something I have to think about and spend time with. But, you know, again, there are some times where I'm designing something that's like well within my comfort zone and that's a real pleasure and fun to work on something like that, but it's not a guarantee that you're always going to be working on things like that in your career. So my thought has been that I had to have a process that I could rely on that would allow me to consistently develop ideas that I felt good about that I could bank on. I think, you know, generating ideas and creativity, I suspect that it's very similar to like most things in life. It's like a, like a kind of a muscle in the same way you can become practiced at, you know, reading, you get better at reading, you get better at martial arts, you get better at um, communicating with people. 
Um, you get better at shooting free throws, snowboarding, everything we do. I think generating ideas, engaging in the process of like thinking abstractly, visualizing things internally. Those are processes that you can become more confident at over time through a process of continued engagement with it in a, like every day. If you spend some time generating ideas every day, you're going to get better at generating ideas and you're going to get to a place where you become a little less uh, self-critical about the ideas you're generating. And that frees you up to be able to create, to generate even more ideas. And then you begin to engage or you begin to create like a positive feedback loop for yourself. You start to gain momentum, just like in everything else in life, like when you spend time rehearsing and engaging in it. I really think that's the case with ideas. I've, I've worked with a lot of people in games and entertainment that are very quick to cut themselves off from their ideas, like to shut themselves down. You know, the sort of, it's like that negative uh, self-talk. You know, that they'll say to themselves, oh, I, someone's already thought of that. I saw that before, you know, saw it on ArtStation. They already did that. That's not original. That's, it's basically yeah, just negative self-talk. And from my perspective, the people that appear to be the most creative, they're really just like putting together a more subtle synthesis of ideas than the rest of the community you're currently engaging with. So they stand out, their ideas stand out as being more unique, but they're not necessarily unique. They come from somewhere. They're a product of variables that exist and can be traced. You can analyze those ideas. You can retrace them. And I find that to be both encouraging and very useful and just a, like a practical sense as far as idea generation for myself, like identifying common tropes, like archetypes, things that resonate and have resonated for a long time with humans and our storytelling, our culture of storytelling. So I think what I'm going to do next in order to push these a little bit further, because I have just been talking and making some random shapes. There's a little process I'll do called uh, silhouette kit bashing. You're going to see here. So I'm going to extend my canvas again, press C, extend that canvas out. I'm going to grab some of these shapes. Again, this is more like designing from abstraction here. Watch. I'm going to grab like this part of this guy's head, bring it over here onto this lion guy's head. Let's bring him down here. Now, when this really becomes useful, then you already have like a, you have some basic ideas to work with. You've got, you're starting from something. So right now I'm just like, like this will work, but I'm gonna take that shape. That's kind of fun. Maybe take these spines here from this guy, bring them over here. Maybe I'm gonna drag those out and stretch them, use my distort tool, my warp tool to give them a bit of, let's see here. Okay, so this is silhouette kit bashing where I'm taking parts from the silhouettes that initially blocked in and then taking those and pushing them to a place where uh, it's a little further than maybe what I'd initially imagined. Or I'm, I'm basically looking, I'm creating conditions for happy accidents to occur. I've mentioned that before in previous videos. At a certain point, like a certain level of designing from abstraction like begins to take place in my work, but Usually not until I've already got something like, like laid down. Like say I block in some character silhouettes or poses and I'll take parts from those poses, start to mash them together. Oh, what if that shoulder pad, how would that shoulder pad look over here? Or how might the, that set of rockets look on that guy's back? How might that helmet actually look on this guy over here? Or that guy's really big arm might look really cool as a asymmetrical design element over on this guy. And until I'd laid those pieces out there, I couldn't find those, like those combinations wouldn't be um, available to me. This one's kind of cool. One above it's like not bad. This one's kind of lame. Let's we'll start them over. Boom, let's not be afraid to start over. Let's take monitor lizard head. It's kind of plain. Let's figure out a way to make him look cooler. Let's take this cool jaw. Now I'm going to actually visualize, I'm going to slow down a second and think about a shape of like a jawbone as I cut out this part of the, from the silhouette. Do you see that? Kind of like a, a abstracted, not abstracted, but like a kind of generalization of a approximation of a horse jawbone. That's cool. 
I'm going to make some kind of crazy carnesial type teeth back here. Carnesials are the meat shearing teeth that you have on predators like uh, big cats. Like you have it on animals that eat a lot of meat. Oh, here's an, okay, here's, you know, I mentioned silhouette kit bashing. This is something I'll do sometimes, like just generate that shape right there. And then I'm going to take a, du a duplicate of it. Let's see. Yeah, drag it out. Let's see, and I can start to like move it around inside my my creature. He's getting a bit tooth heavy right now. This guy's head's a little bit absurd as far as teeth are concerned, but whatever. Sometimes, you know, from a visual design standpoint, if you're just trying to like thinking, you know, as that, that sign designer we've talked about before, and I think about like teeth as a graphic design element are very, they're very like, a, they're a potent tool, they're a useful design tool. They mean something in an ancient way. You know, you saw a mouth. I'll show you something really quick just as a fun test. Make my screen dark. Is an ancient, an ancient visual. That our ancestors that it's right here. Should to look at this real quick. This right here. You don't need to know anything else about what you're looking at right now on the screen. You know what that means. There's something deep inside you. You don't need to see anything else. Just those shapes, like that, those, those that's, only, that's two values, black and white, on and off, working together to communicate danger. Like, like, like the greatest danger you could experience as an ancient, an ancient creature. I mean, it goes beyond mammals, like beyond our mam mammalian ancestors, all the way back to, even to, even to, to fish, like vertebrate fish. And you see that coming out at you and you know that you're about to die, <laughs> that evasive maneuvers are um, being called for. It's time for flight, fight or flight. And uh, so, you know, the reason I show that is because like from my perspective, that's pointing to something. Like there's a reason that teeth are an effective design tool. So if you want to make a creature look really scary, you know, you'll see in a lot of like fantasy games, a lot of like fantasy monsters, horror monsters, you know, the, the designers, we go bananas in terms of teeth because they're a useful and ancient useful design tool that communicates threat instantly, subconsciously for us, for all of us. So we're going to start to introduce our other values. So I'm going to crop this. We're just going to go with these, this group of six for now. Move them down. That's where we get to the, the shape carbification. I'm going to lock my layers. I'm going to bump these up to a mid-tone. Mid-tone gray. I'm going to try to do this real quick, just for fun. Again, for performance sake. You can be as precise with your shapes as... I recommend for students, this is a really great exercise, right? I encourage you to actually slow down and be as precise as you can. Just so you're really forced to think things through. Try to understand your forms. How light is affecting them. Now, some, when I was at Turtle Rock, what I would do is <clears throat> I'd spend the majority of the workday like actually solving problems and making things look good. But then I'd spend like the last couple minutes of the day before I left doing a quick block in like this. That would help ensure freshness. It was almost like a fun test for myself. So watch. I spent that time. How long was that, Alec? Maybe, I don't know, a minute or something, right? Then go through. Boom. And hit those shapes. And now these things begin to take on some form. They begin to read. Again, they're quite loose, but it's a starting point. Now I'm going to go through and start to adjust a little bit more. Now with this character, I was doing kind of like a sort of like a sea elephant seal thing. I don't even remember. So I have some elephant seal deal. This guy was our crazy Fantasy Lambiosaurus, or that will be in shadow. I don't like where I place that eye at all. I'm going to redo that. It's like a wolf guy, goofy werewolf with 5,000 teeth rear. We'll, we'll mess with him a little more, push him, make him better. So I'm holding down the shift key. You'll hear that like pop, 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 because I'm adding to my selections. 
So I'll go through laying some strokes, which I hold down shift key. Go to my lasso tool. And you have to release it for a second. Between making the new selection. Now, all this, th this is just gesture drawing. All, all I'm doing right here are just gesture drawing, just like, like uh, drawing these, these shadow shapes, drawing around the form. Again, loosely, this is not that accurate. But from my perspective, all this, everything I'm doing here is a result of time spent doing a lot of gesture drawing when I was in college. I credit that to a couple teachers at Cal State Long Beach, Robin Richeson and Mark Michelin, who were both, um, they both, some of their work professionally was as uh, a lot of their work, I think. But I think they did other things too. And like I know Robin did concept art and costume illustration and uh, Mark did um, editorial illustration for like newspapers and stuff and magazines. <clears throat> But both of them did a lot of work or still do a lot of work as storyboard artists for Hollywood. And that job is very dependent upon, you know, expressive, quick mark making, like storytelling through line. And most of the time, the majority of the stories that are being told feature humans, like human beings. Not always. Every once in a while you get, you know, some... Friggin' squirrels and troll, you know, trolls and whatever weird heroes that we get in stories, but majority of the time it's people. It's not about having, you know, when you're working as a concept artist or a storyboard artist, it's not necessarily about having like the most accurate, perfect anatomy. It's about having convincing anatomy. So I, I think for students, like the best thing you can do early on is do a lot of gesture drawing of people and clothing. And heavy jackets because you get real defined like big shapes denim jackets leather jackets hoodies jeans you know people wearing backpacks especially concept artists like how many games like every game ever has their hero you know with a backpack on <laughs> like going through like that's just a thing like you're you know the last of us you know dungeons and dragons adventures they have their gear that allows them to go into the wilds and engage in adventures. It's like a th it's a thing. It's not to say you don't need to know anatomy. You do. You need to know enough again to be able to play. I really think the you know art school, <clears throat> the karate school analogy is a really apt one because I, I did some martial arts for a while and I remember like thinking sometimes like like okay so you have to know this freaking kata before you get your green belt or whatever like. And it always felt so arbitrary and it was really just like, I don't know, I feel like you could see through it pretty quickly. The idea is just like, until you've mastered these particular movements, you got to keep, like it keeps you in that ecosystem longer, you know? Oh, you're not ready to go to do this thing. So you're going to have to stay involved in our business model for another five years. And that means they get to keep sapping your money. I think a lot of the same kind of thing applies to art, basically. What I'm saying there. You know, there's some, there are as many ways to create art as there are human beings that have like lived on our planet because there's a certain amount of like awareness we all have of a, a little bit, a bit of like bravery that is necessary in order to begin to make those kind of like movements in your life. Those kind of, uh, I don't know, it's like taking a stand in your own life in terms of your art. Pretty cool. I'm going to introduce some like, just some... other values here now to start to push this stuff a bit. These in the eyes and teeth, you'll see. Or just like, uh, is it Zadislav, Vladislav, Bixinski? You know, people with the world building capabilities like James Gurney. Alphonse Mucha, 
Heinrich Kley, Justin Sweet. I use the rectangular marquee tool. Some of you are just new to Photoshop again, and this is not for the pros, okay? Just, but it's some, sometimes I do these things quick. A lot of us do in demos, but this might actually be useful to someone that's new to Photoshop. So I use my rectangular marquee tool. The shortcut is M, just M for marquee. See, it brings up these, like the marching ants, you know? And you can set it to different, like basic shapes, like just a, you know, an ellipse or a square. I like the square one. And I press the, I think I press V. Yeah, it's really like for move. And then I can move that eye back a little bit on the head of that creature. Okay, so now I wanna be able to do a little bit more with my, my third value I'm bringing in. So I need to knock back my background. I need to knock it down a bit. It's like maybe like a 20%, 30% gray. I guess something like that. And I'm gonna darken these a bit to make them pop. I want to introduce maybe a little more with my white, do something more with it. I'm going to grab these teeth because I want to pop this stuff out a bit. I already did my like pixel lock on that. So I'm going to grab those. Now, realistically, um, you know, if these cast shadows, like these shadows are that harsh, like the white's not going to pop in that way in real life. But this isn't really about real life lighting. This is about making these values pop and making this stuff exciting to look at on a page. Let's work on this one a little more. I'm going to push him further. Okay, so I think I'm going to be committing to, at least like more or less committing to this character here. Thanks for now, you know, for our, again, our limited time. This one I'm going to push a bit and play with. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Okay. So at this point, like I kind of like this guy. These other ones are sort of whatever. I'm going to grab this. I'll take a stamp just so I have that. Okay. It's back down. Duplicate. This one. All these. Delete them. Take this guy. Let's scale them up. Let's see if we can do three. Now again, this is with no reference. So if I really want to push this further, what I might want to do, I'm not sure if I do want to, is bring in, like maybe, I could see maybe like a giant tegu or some kind of monitor lizard being useful here. Some of those shapes for this guy's jaw, or like crocodile jaw, that kind of deal. Or maybe even something like a pit bull being useful if I really wanted to get anatomical.
I'm not sure if I do want to get anatomical. Okay, yes. I, I think I read something once on the Gurney Journey blog. Good old Mr. Gurney. Or maybe it was on Muddy Colors. I think it was on Gurney Journey. And <clears throat> someone was asking, like, should I be drawing from imagination or drawing from, you know, from life? And he's like, both. And I think it really depends on what you're trying to do. But, um, like, I know a majority of my career has been doing, like, kind of stylized things and fantastical things. And so the drawing from imagination has been really important to be able to do that in a way that has, like, some, like, I don't know, personality or voice attributed to it. But if you're going to be, you know, working in, a, like, a greater de degree of realism, you know, or creating like realistic fantasy illustrations for something like Magic the Gathering, where all your forms have to be like very resolved, you know, all the forms and lighting and materials have to be resolved, then working from life is going to be really important because, you know, you're like focusing on, on like a still frame that's meant to, in some ways, like transport you to a, like a scene, to a place. Oh, that's cool. I'm going to get in some crazy here. Ooh, that's neat. It's totally turning into not a pterodactyl guy, but I like it better. So again, I think, I think it depends on what you're trying to do. I don't think it's actually, I just get bored of drawing from life. It's this, I, I really don't like to do it. Actually, I prefer to do almost everything from, from imagination. But that comes with a kind of a consequence again. So, like, my stuff is going to look crazier. <laughs> it's going it's to look sometimes less convincing, you know, or less um, informed. Because I am not informed in all cases. I'm just going from, like, you know, approximations, like memory, visual memory. Sometimes that suffices. At best, that suffices. At worst, it looks like I really don't know what the f I'm doing. But that's okay because, you know, part of being a professional is knowing like when that matters and when it doesn't and when you need to go and like pull in some information from outside to help uh, like raise the level of fidelity for your imagery. When is that necessary and when is it not? It's kind of up to the artists or like up to again to what you're trying to do. So now like I got to a place where I kind of like this guy in the bottom right. And so realistically, instead of going and redoing and, and like starting fresh on each of these other two, I'm just going to take this guy and drag him out and use his, him as a base to, again, do some select kit bashing. So rather than reinvent the wheel, I should just <clears throat> work with something that already feels strong to me. So this is more of this process that's like, I use the term lateral exploration. It makes a lot of sense to me. Like uh, there's a term in football, the lateral play. Like you can't throw, after the quarterback throws the ball, you can't throw the ball forward again. It can only be, it can only be thrown to the side laterally or backwards. And uh, so a lot of, when I'm doing these sort of iterations, Sometimes I, I'll use the term like micro iterations too when I really want to exhaust an idea and I've got a lot of time and I'm really being crazy about it. Um, in each case, it, it helped me manage my own obsessive nature. Like there were, it was kind of a joke. There's a particular producer at Turtle Rock who would come by my desk and he'd be like, this or that. I hope he sees this. He'd be like, this or that. And he was making fun of me because I would be working on one image and I just for the command Z, command Z, command Z, like... What if, what if, you know, <laughs> I'd be like ob obsessing about mark making and stuff. And mark making to me is actually really important. I love mark making. But when it comes to like concept art working on the job, you can't obsess over that kind of thing. You got to get done. So I, I, when I started this process of like just taking that image that I've been working on and said dragging out a duplicate, and then I got to have both. I got to have my cake and eat it too. I got to have this and that and everything in between. And I could really push an, an idea to its limit. And it is often the case that after I engage in that process, I could then select from that buffet and do more of the kit bashing and come up with new combinations that I had I'd never anticipated. Uh, it's been really useful to, to me.
but it always starts with some amount of like I have to have something some like kernel like something to work with initially you know typically for it to work Alex is not hooked up to the mic but he asked why do you choose the three values I think it's because it, it pops and it's simple it's easy it's like the quickest way to get a an, an impactful read the biggest bang for my buck come my midtones my shadow shapes then I'm using I'm using those that darker value in a somewhat like interpretive fashion as well. It's not just actually, I'm not just using it in like a literally descriptive way. Like it's not real lighting in all cases. Sometimes I'm using it to describe form. Sometimes I'm using it more like a shorthand for like a local value, like the color of fur or of a mane, a, a horns, etc. So I'm kind of like moving between. And then that third. I'll, I'll use like the, a term like thematic focal points and like I mentioned the like how what a powerful visual tool uh, teeth are for communicating like danger or threat and so I'll use white to help uh, make those teeth those teeth pop off the page or you could use it for weapons like if you're doing your character thumbnails weapons insignias it's really useful for VFX it's like a kind of um, it's a, like, I'll show you really quick. It's a, in general, it's a super easy way to communicate like VFX, like this thing, magic, watch. Whoops, I shouldn't have that made that magic though. That's a tooth. But maybe these horns are magic or like these little glowy bits coming off of the that little bit of flame or in the eyes. Like that that as a shorthand when you're just designing, you know, in the early stages, you're, you're just focusing on communication of shapes and ideas. It's not about, um, it's not necessary to have the character like fully realized in every single aspect from my perspective. And so, you know, whether this thing is going to be made of like lightsaber, um, plasma blade crap or space magic or, you know, fire, ectoplasm, you know, I don't know, pixie dust, like it doesn't matter. It's just, it's a shorthand. It's like, it's like cursive for, cursive for, for magic or VFX go here. And then that will have to be uh, developed further later on. Yeah, for me, it's just really about, it's just, so like getting the most bang for my buck. And, and I, I think, I, I just find it appealing. I just actually like it. I respond to it well, for some reason, like this really graphic, simple nature stuff. I'm just a big fan of like graphic design. Um, it's got a lot of clarity. Yeah, a lot of clarity. Nice. Thank you, Alec. Yeah, a lot of clarity. Can you can see it? Like I when I watch when I zoom out. Imagine you're presenting this to like a bunch of your coworkers. You're going to print it out on the wall in your office. You put this kind of thing up. You're going to be able to see. The idea is that you should be able to see this thing, get a read on it, be able to get excited about it, respond to it from I don't know, like 20 feet away. Ideally, that's the kind of thing I'm going for. I'm thinking of it like, like a graphic designer, like a sign. And as a concept artist, from my perspective, that's like ultimately one of your main responsibilities is like get people hyped about things. So most of the, most of the, like the stage that I'm typically involved in, that's, that's my job is to get people hyped for possibilities. What something could become, you know, if invested in it, if we invest in it further. It certainly could be done other ways. You know, maybe a greater range of values that can treat, and sometimes I have in the past. But over time, I've kind of gotten to like, there's just a way I've sort of like a default to because I like the result that allows me to get into a like the, like a rhythm, like like I'm sort of in now a little bit. For for me, uh, there's like a particular some shapes I really like in a mane of hair that I'm pretty sure are taken from. Like a Frisian horse or an Andal yeah, Frisian, I think. Like, like, have you ever seen a horse where its mane starts to get a little bit like greasy and starts to dread up a bit? That look, 
<clears throat> be really cool. It starts to clump just a little bit. You know, it's not like Vidal Sassoon, flowy, Fabio Main. It's like a little bit nasty. Been out in the wild killing stuff. Got some blood in there. Really like that kind of mane. And also it's like a bit of a ethereal quality at the same time. Like it's sort of like a shape of shadow and shape of mane that start to blend together. That to me makes it's kind of evocative. It's it's like the sh it's a shape of fear. Yeah. Do you find it helpful having all your iterations of things on one page? Yeah. So I'll just ask, do you find it useful to have all of your iterations on one page? And I definitely do. Alec is leading me here. Thank you, friend. Um, yeah, for me, it's real important because, you know, you could just have all of your concepts like most artists do. They have them on like separate files. But uh, to me, you kind of miss out on an opportunity there. Like you miss an opportunity. For me, I like to see all my options in front because I can compare and contrast them in real time. You know, I can weigh them against one another. And then I, pe I can begin to participate, like, and engage in that act of, like, again, that kit bashing. Or I can look for possible combinations, like, oh, you know what? That cool tongue, that might look really neat over here. Or that horn might look really awesome over here. Like, let's see. Let's grab that horn. Let's bring it over here. Boom on this guy. Yeah, exactly. But I wouldn't have been able to do that if they weren't on the same page. I just, like, grabbed this whites and copy pasted it and brought it there and it just got bananas. But I kind of like that earlier variation too. And this is why this is why you get to the this or that, this or that. And so I may now adjust my composition to include the four variants. So let's see, go to this and this, take out that. Sometimes I just want these like broken edges just to spice things up. Like, it, I don't know, it just has a little more care than just like a round brush stroke, you know? It brings like a little more life to it. There's like, there's like, it's almost like individuality in this in the stroke itself or like simulating it or something attempting to simulate it by going back and cutting into that round brush trigger I could I could have just left it but I think it makes it a little bit more interesting when I go back and mess it up a bit so when you're in this stage of more fine-tuning a design do you still allow yourself the freedom to make radical changes? Yeah, it just, it, yeah, it just, so Alec just asked like when I'm at this stage in a design, do I still allow myself the freedom to make radical changes? Yeah, sometimes, sometimes that's pretty fun. I won't always necessarily do that. When I get to this point, I am kind of obsessing. I'm really trying to make these like cool. I'm like pushing in like cool factor, like switches a lot of just attention to mark making and stuff, but say, you know, a lot of where that can happen, that's where an art director can, a good art director can be, or like some, you know, having a good eye, like a good collaborator on your team can be really useful because they can come in and be like, you know, what if you made that? Like, what if that was bigger? What if you adjusted those, like some of those sort of like big calls that you, you just may be totally blind to, you know, you, you may not be, you know, just sensitive to in the moment picking up on and then that can really help you push something with that note in mind do you like to uh take breaks at this stage and like get away from the thing yes like, typically i do like i usually you know like realistically like on the job all i would i would not be i don't know how many hours this has been but i won't just sit this long like i would go to the you know go get a drink go get a coffee or you know, maybe take my lunch break, go to the gym. I find it very useful to just like get outside, get away from the screen. Uh, I like to make sure I include time to do that. Because I will really get obsessive and have to like almost plan for that in my process, like anticipate it and attempt to manage it. Okay, but it might be getting to a place where I, I want to call it. Like, these are kind of cool, kind of fun, kind of crazy. But, like, I feel like I'm, the idea of, like, crazy wolf goat thing is coming through. 
And uh, that's sort of what I've come to here with this creature design. And it's, it's sort of all coming from a conversation with Alec about something we're going to do for a potential theme we're going to do for Monstober, where he threw out the idea of like Black Phillip. But basically, I just made some iterations on, on Black Phillip, this kind of like wolf, ram, goat, horse thing, you know, mutated monster thing. And from my perspective, I've sort of done enough with it here, like enough of those ideas have come through that I could, I would feel comfortable like stopping for this session. If this was like an initial broad strokes concept, I would feel for, you know, this creature's face. And it's really just, this is more about being an evocative piece, um, communicating some like tone, you know, tonally what this creature might be like, character might be like. And I feel like I've hit that enough for today. So it's a good place to stop. You know, as we, I started with some like ridiculous, like, crappy fantasy dinosaur shapes and got all the way. It's interesting because you really could see the designing from abstraction thing play out. I'm just responding to the shapes that are, um, and I'm responding. My response is a result of some things that are laying just beneath my conscious thoughts. And there's a couple, couple points here. Like Alec is chatting with Alec and he kind of reminded me like just like, I always, like, name my stuff. I always, it's, like, a big part of character design from my perspective. A big part of, like, infusing your designs with some amount of, like, like identity. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring that name, like, Black Phillip, into this piece. We're going to write it up here. I kind of, like, okay, this just doesn't read, but I, like, I kind of like it. There's... I, now that would be cool though. I like when there's like a bit of um, oh, over like overlap. I just can't have it quite that intense. So much that it like kind of doesn't read anymore. Okay, now a couple last touches at the end. I'm gonna do the glow, the glow stuff, the glow hacks. Mostly on the eyes. Something about this is like a manual thing. It's like, well, it's where it's really from is uh, a lot of like nighttime predators, like nocturnal predators. They have this thing called the tapetum lucidum. Uh, you see it like in uh, night shots of like, uh, or like when you shine like a light on an animal, like a possum crossing the road, you know, or raccoons, lions, hyenas, when they're being uh, filmed at night and you shine spotlights. They have this like super reflective part of their. I, it's like a, it's like a mirror that helps like any amount of, I don't know all the science, maybe Gurney does, someone smarter than me. I did once, took a marine biology class. Basically, it allows you to gather more light into your eye. And it has this very like disturbing um, sort of property, or at least it does to me. It's a reminder of the fact that those things can see in the dark and your can't. And it's sort of like, I don't know, there's something kind of ghostly about it too. And in Mignola's comics, he does that all the time. Those like creepy creatures that are like, you know, doing the, the golem like meh, looking towards camera and then you see the glowing eyes. That's what's really glow going on in glowing eyes. You're seeing a kind of shorthand um, interpretation of the idea of the tapetum lucum. Okay, so I did the glow eyes. Then I'm going to do some other little hacky finishing moves here that I'd like to do. Make it look cooler than it really is. I think I mentioned why I did this once, maybe in another video. Okay, so this, this is, I remember I was trying, there was like a period where I was like really trying to um, learn, I was trying to figure out like how Moby Frankie did his thing when he was like working with us at Turtle Rock. He's my, he was my hero. And I was like, how he do? And so I was looking up all his art and, um, you know, I found some of his Dota 2 stuff online, but there's not much of it that you can find. You can only find like photos of the art that were like basically, um, probably like, they probably were not supposed to leave the Valve campus. Um, Basically, someone had come in like a spy and like taken photographs of the concept art. But there was something kind of cool about those photos of the concept art because they were from like, it's like a secondhand version of the art where you had 
the print that the team had printed out for their walls and those prints had like smudges and some crap on them from being like, you know, live printouts in the, that are being used like in a day-to-day -day basis. So they have like crud on them and it's like a photo of that, that there's like a bit of warping. Um, uh, I don't know. There's something interesting about that. It's almost like finding a, like a top secret document, you know, <laughs> like when you see something like top secret, it makes you like more intrigued to look at it. There's something about that, that I experienced that really resonated with me. And I, I thought that'd be a fun thing to try to like replicate or play with in my own presentation. It's like you're getting to see something you shouldn't be seeing and that makes it more awesome. Okay, but I'm going to do a couple of little things here. Let's see if they work. I'm genuinely curious, like, does your nitpicking of things, like, how much of your time does that take up when you're, like, working on stuff? Is it, like, most of the time? A lot, yeah. yeah. More, than <laughs> is, more than is, like, good. Yeah. I mean, I've heard I've heard that a lot before. That it's like you spend twenty percent of the time doing eighty percent of the work, and yeah. eighty percent of the time doing twenty percent of the work. Yeah, I could stop a lot of times, like way earlier on stuff. But I also think that's the difference between really good art and not. Yeah, yeah. I really do. Like a lot of guys stop oh, yeah. prematurely, and that's why their yeah, stuff is kind of lame. Yeah. Can I get Specky to make good art? So you typically make the blacks like just very saturated. Yeah, actually, very saturated helps on pop. I think the cooler one is very warm. Is more blue? Yeah, personally. Because it goes more like, you know, complimentary color. Mm -hmm. I think that general range of blue green, blue gray green, green, it's like very zombie horse yeah. color, you know? Zombie Some horse zombie goat. Paranormal. Yeah, it looks hair. better now. Yeah. Alright guys, I think we're gonna call it. I'm feeling pretty good about this. Just want to say thanks a lot for watching and thanks to Stan and the team at Proco for putting this together. And thanks to everyone at Lightbox for inviting me. Hope all of you guys at home are enjoying Lightbox online. And uh, yeah, that's it. Take care, enjoy the rest of your summer, stay safe, and I'll see you guys around. Bye-bye. All right guys, thanks for joining Scott's live stream. We got a Kim Jong-gi Q&A coming up tomorrow. And also, Court Jones is doing a caricature demo tomorrow. And then finally on Sunday, Marshall and I are doing a Q&A as a Draftsman episode. See you then.